Here, here, here's the idea. Elias. What? These are very serious questions. Are you ready? What? What? Why? Why are you so serious? Is this really gonna go to the finish? <laughs> what do I want for Christmas? Oh, I want a new car key. <laughs> Every time I try to unlock my car, it takes me at least five times <laughs> to try. So I would love a new car key. All right, Emma, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, what do you want for Christmas? Um, a new dolly. A new dolly? Yeah. What type of dolly? Um, a new one that everybody has. A new bike, a camera. I need some new shoes. I've been wearing these shoes for like a year now. I think my dad's in the audience, so new shoes on, on the Christmas list. Dougie, right? Yeah. What do you want for Christmas? A Hot Wheels set? Oh, yeah? Yeah. What kind? One that we score Hot Wheels. A lot of Legos. I'm going to get a Lego double-decker bus and a Lego boat. A big one. So, what do you want for Christmas? Baby dolls. You want baby dolls? Mm -hmm. What I want this Christmas, I mean, if I'm being selfish, an espresso maker. Ooh. But, right? I also want an espresso maker. <laughs> um, a hippopotamus. hippopotamus. <laughs> <laughs> Love. <laughs> all, all my homies just want to be loved. Wait, Thank wait, you wait, guys. You gotta answer the question for real though. I'm trying to get. Um... No, I was dead serious. Yeah. <laughs> I want an American gold doll and an American gold doll horse and an American gold doll um, dog house. I want Air Force Jordans. Money. <laughs> so I can buy whatever I want because sometimes when people give me presents. Actually, no, that's bad. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> no. I want money too. I want money for Christmas. Money. I want a new car, a Hummer, some more tattoos. Wow. <laughs> I want a PS5, and uh, that's it. What do I want? I'd enjoy a PS5. PlayStation? <laughs> I want headphones because I have a phone, and the little port thing doesn't go in the, head the phone. But I also would like a cookbook. A minion robot. It has um, a control and you can say whatever you want it to do. What I want for Christmas is an RC airplane and a Lego plane. I want a dog. What type of dog? I want a Yorkie. We're gonna we're gonna take this week and next week and we're gonna. I want to hone in on this idea that we're working on this Christmas of a weary world rejoicing. And my message today, I'm titling Christmas Lights. Who would put up Christmas lights at your house? Or you put point at the person next to you. Yeah, the dads are like, it was me. Don't even raise your hand, wife. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, you put them up, right? You got the lights up. I love the Christmas lights. I love that season. I love... Um, and what I want to do here is I'm going to put up some pictures here of um, Budapest at Christmas time because this, is, I, this was my favorite time of the year to live in Budapest. January was terrible, but December was amazing. This is what the city looks like when you're uh, starting in the end of November. And the reason I love Christmas lights is because there's something about this, like there's something beautiful about when it's freezing outside. And I mean freezing, not like freezing like 50. I mean like fr actual freezing. And the days are super short, but then you are drawn out by just the beauty of the whole city all over. You, I'm so like, I want to stay inside, but then there's that outside, and I want to go out. I'm drawn to it. And Christmas reminds us of something that I think is so powerful. It's that there is beauty that pours out of darkness, you know, every year at this time, the night, it's, it, you know, we're getting to the darkest time of the year all around the world, for the most part, at least the northern part, and we are reminded that there is, out of the darkness, there can come great light. And of course, I had to put up a few pictures of food, just because the food is a big part of my celebration. Amen? Okay. And then there's this. This is like the greatest thing in the world. It's called a kutush kolach, and that is a, uh, it's like a giant, beautiful cinnamon roll that you just don't share with anyone. You fight if somebody tries to take that. So, yeah, I had to put it up even though it has nothing to do with my message today. 
The Christmas story is a story of God shining light into darkness. Just, it's the very reason that, you know, kind of the whole idea of why we put up the Christmas lights. We, uh, we were, we, from beginning of this story of Christmas, we're told that God shined a bright light to lead people to meet his son, Jesus. And I want to read that. In fact, um, if you have a Bible, it's going to be Matthew too. Here's the thing. The story of Christmas has become such a familiar story. Where are we look at it every year. We know it. And it lures us into a complacency. It lures us into a complacency. I know the story. And, uh, but remember, we talked about this, how easy it is to know something, but then to experience it inside. And we want to have this move from head to heart as much as we can and ask God to reveal truth and grace to us. So don't let the story that is so familiar to you lure you into a complacency of, oh, I already know this story. Let's read it fresh. And I want to focus in on this idea of the Christmas lights. Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Verse 3, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with them, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired where the Christ was to be born. Verse 5, So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, But you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will be my shepherd, and you will shepherd my people. Verse 7, then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what, the star, what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him. And when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with exceedingly great joy. Verse 11, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. They fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I mentioned this idea last week, and I want to um, teach on it this week. And that is um, the idea of the importance of the kind of the Christmas star, which I, I also said to you last week, that this year is the first, December 21st. It's the brightest that you will see the quote-unquote Christmas star in, since 1226. So you weren't there. Okay, so it's, uh, it's going to be the, the brightest that we're going to see it in over 800 years will be this year on December 21st. Now, is this the Christmas star? Or is this just the thing that we call the Christmas? Yeah, I have no idea. Uh, nobody can say for certain. But what we do know is this, is that at some point in history, at the birth of Jesus, God used a bright star to lead certain group of people to come to find where Jesus was. I want to read to you from the Old Testament, from the book of Numbers. God used a very unusual dude by the name of Balaam, and he prophesied, and he said this. He was prophesying, and he wrote he said these words, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. And then he wrote this, a star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Timul. He was talking about the coming Messiah. God was going to use a star to direct people to the one who would be the star of the world. The star of Israel, the star of the world. And the wise men were told to follow the star from the east, and they made their way to Jerusalem. And what's significant about this is, and you got to understand this, there's a lot of like ideas. How did these wise men know to, you know, all these things? And the answer is this, we really don't know exactly. We have no real idea. Here's what we do know. They did not know the Bible. They didn't even know about the Bible. How do I know that? Because if they had, they would have known the prophecy that the Pharisees told them. That was Micah 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, though you are little among the thousands, yet out of you will come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. So had they known the Bible, they would have known that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem, but they did not know the Bible. Somehow, God revealed to these people 
that there was a star to follow that would lead them to the king of kings, to the savior of the world. And so they followed the star, and then, and then as they're in proximity, they're, you know, they're following a the star, and then they see that the biggest city in their area is the city of Jerusalem. So they go to Jerusalem, and they inquire from the king, where is this new king? Where was he, where is he born exactly? We've been following the star, and we're here because we don't know where to go next. And of course, if you know the story of uh, the birth of Jesus, you know that King Herod, who was like a, like a wannabe kind of a king, he was jealous because, you know, wannabe kings don't like real kings, so he was going to set out to kill Jesus. And so he didn't know where the king was going to be born. He asked all of his religious leaders, like, hey, where is the king, you know, supposed to be born? And they said, well, the Bible says in Micah 5 that he'd be born in, in Bethlehem. And so the king tells the wise men this, and then follows the, you know, in essence was going to, you know, uh, you know, it's basically it's like, hey, now I know where the king has been born. So we can go there. And the story goes on later on and uh, where Herod kills all of these babies that were born in Bethlehem during that time. But of course, God had already spoken to Mary and Joseph to move Jesus out of Bethlehem. But here's the thing I want you to see. They come to Jerusalem because it was the biggest city in the area because that's where the star led them. They ask, they find out it's Bethlehem. So they turn in the direction of Bethlehem. And when they started to go in that direction, did you notice it? It says the star led them again. From the very beginning of their journey to the very end when they actually saw Jesus, which by the way, we don't believe, even though the pictures, it makes for a much nicer nativity scene. We don't think Jesus was like a little baby still at that point, you know. He's probably a crawling toddler at this point. Uh, but they move from the beginning of their journey in the Far East to all of a sudden when they meet Jesus, it was a star that led them along the way. It was a star that led them. God shines light into darkness. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. This has been our theme verse for quite a while. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God used a light to lead wise men to Jesus and God is shining light into our darkness to show us our need for Jesus. In other words, nothing's changed. What he literally did in this moment in history he continues to do in our history. And I want to circle back to this idea that I mentioned earlier, and it's this. These wise men had no or limited knowledge about the God of the Bible. It's not like they were reading, you know, and a lot of people will tell you, oh, these were the same. These were like the people who followed the prophecies of Daniel. It's possible, but we don't really know. We just don't know much about these guys. We just don't. But what we do know is that somehow they knew that if they followed this star, it would lead them to the Savior of the world, the King of Kings. And why am I saying this? And I think this is a really important point that we understand at Christmas. It's this. For God so loved the world, and I want to emphasize that part for a moment, there was no privileged group of people who, had only, who were the only ones that were going to get access to Jesus. God used a star to lead a group of people who never even knew anything about the Bible to bring them to the knowledge of his Savior. Christianity, this is so key. I know we know it, but it's so important to be reminded of this. Christianity is not a Western religion. It wasn't for Europeans and their descendants. Christianity, I mean, especially when its birthplace is not even European, uh, Christianity is, the, is this. God became one of us and died for all of us so that any of us could have eternal life. And so there was, you know, God was reaching people there in the Middle East where, they, where Jesus was born, but from the Far East, God was sending out a message to let them know that the king of all kings had been born. You know, you, you and I have been like dropped on this planet and we've got, we're like, we're one little drop in this big scale of eternity. And yet, have you ever wondered, like, it's like we're so small compared to the bigger picture of things and yet we still want more. 
We always want more. I mean, you know, ask your kids. And you don't need to ask your kids. Ask yourself. We don't, you know, you don't want to be on video saying that as much, but we all want more. Sometimes it's expressed in a material setting. I want a dolly. I want an American girl toy. I want a this. I want that. Whatever it is, right? I want, a, I want something more. Why? Because though you and I are finite and we're this little drop in this giant thing called humanity, and yet into that, you and I were made in the same image of God. And because of that, we have a longing for more. In fact, I think we need to flip this a little bit. Because when somebody wants more, we, we tend to be like, oh, don't, you shouldn't want more. You shouldn't want more. And I'm a Christian, I should just be content and not want more. Now, of course, you know, if you want a Hummer, I'm going to guess that ain't happening, okay? That might be a little bit more than, but here's what I'm talking about. I think we have this tendency within our Christian faith to be like, oh man, I just want more. And there's people to say, oh, just calm down, be happy with what you've got. Friends, you were made for more. You were made for more. You were made for like, when you reach the end of you, I mean, when you have no more peace, you were made for more. When you have no more love, you were made for more. When you have no more joy because it is so dark and you see no light, you were made for more. God made you, God made me for more. And here's a group of people who have no connection to the Judeo concept of God. There's no Bible. There's no, they got nothing. They got a star in the sky and somehow, somehow God had spoken to them. And yet they wanted more. They wanted more for their life. And they were willing to follow that star literally to the ends of their world in order to discover more. We must see this. We must see this in the world around us and in our own hearts. We were made for more. When people are going after the more in the wrong way, we don't need to be upset at them for doing that. We need to remind them the reason you're longing for something, the reason you're, you're going after this thing, you're, you shouldn't be going after that that way, but you were made for more. You were made for more. And what happens is when we don't know Christ, we go after more in all the wrong directions. And let me be honest, when we do know Christ, we tend to go after the more in all the wrong directions. We were made to experience more. Christmas reminds us of that. But I also want to remind you, and I've circled it a few times, God is faithful to make himself known to the world. You know, there's this kind of this feeling of like, um, you know, how, you know, how could God do that? And, and, and you can work through the whole problem. Like, who was it that helped these guys to know that they should even be thinking about a star in the sky? I mean, and there's ideas and there's books you can read all about and you can figure, you know, here's their name. In fact, some in church history, they'll tell you their names. These are the names of the wise men. We don't know if any of that's true. What we do know is this. Somehow, God made these people know that there was a king being born and they should want to know him. Somehow. And you know what? That gives me so much hope. You know what that does? That makes me right. Even when I say that, it makes me think, Lord, reach the people in my life that don't know you yet. Because I'm not going to get them there. But you can, Lord. You could do it. And Lord, I think they're so far away from you. But here's the story. Here's the Christmas story. No one is too far from Jesus. No one. He can bring any, from far away, he can bring them to himself. In fact, let me just suggest this. You are a living testimony that people that were far away can be made near to Jesus. We might think, oh, no, I was kind of like, you know, I grew up in the church. I don't care. You grew up in, in, literally in the building. You ain't a Christian until you put your faith in Jesus. You can grow up. You could be born in here for all. Please don't, but you know what I'm saying here. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, I just, oh, like, oh, those people that are so far, oh, they really need you. No, you're just as far away. You and I are just as far from God until we put our faith in Jesus. The Christmas story is the reminder that God takes people who were far away like me and like you, and he drew us to himself. How? Christmas light. It's always been Christmas light. It's always been that way that God shined light into this world that was dark, and he has shined light in the darkness of my heart through the face of Jesus Christ. It's the same thing over 
and over. It happened for the first time at Christmas, but it has happened every day, every hour, every minute, all over the world. God is reaching people. Now, one of the dangers of the Christmas story, especially this idea, is that, well, if God's going to do it, then I don't need to. If God's going to reach those guys from far away, then I don't really need to worry about that. But Jesus taught us a very different path. Jesus didn't say, let me shine stars all over and bring, you know, he said, I'm going to keep doing that, but you are going to go to the world and make disciples. We're going to partner together, in essence, is what God's saying here. I will reach those that no one will be able to reach. You will reach those that are in your world. And I'll do it with you. I'll help you. I will empower you. I will be there. You know, uh, my presence will go with you. My power will go with you. So today, the Christmas light, are you ready? Is you. You are the Christmas light. God's not shining a light in the sky, you know, like follow me. You know, oh, you know, you know people aren't going to be like following, going to Bethlehem. Especially not this year. Ain't nobody going anywhere. You you are the Christmas light. Why does God use light to lead people? 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. And in him there is no darkness. Why does God use light to lead people? One, because we're in darkness. And two, because he's light. It's not what he shines. It's who he is. When God wanted to help Abraham to understand what he was going to do in his life, do you remember this story? If you don't, it's okay. In the book of Genesis, God had made a promise to Abraham that he was going to have, that he was going to cover the world with his descendants. And the problem was that Abraham had no kids yet. And God took Abraham and he said, I want you to look up into the sky and I want you to see all the stars. And he's like, Abraham, count the stars. And Abraham, have you ever, did you ever try counting stars when you were a kid? Or maybe when you were not a kid and you tried? One, two, three. Oh, shoot, I got to start over. Because you, they, they get, it's hard to, right? And Abraham's up there counting, and it's, it's, it's more than you could ever count. And God said, that's how many descendants I'm going to give to you. When God wanted to reveal his glory to Abraham, he said, look at the stars. Look at the light that I've put out there. I'm going to do more in your life than what you could ever count in the heavens. The Bible begins with the story of light. Genesis 1-3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw light that it was good, and he divided light from darkness. God has always been doing this. From literally day one, God has been dividing light and darkness. The Bible begins with the story of light and the Bible ends with Jesus saying these words, Revelation 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. It's always been this way. This is not a Christmas story only. It's the story of the entire Bible that God shines light into darkness. And he has done that now in our hearts to reveal his son Jesus. The world literally began in darkness and we remain in darkness until we let the light of God shine into our hearts and into our lives. Far off is not geographic. Okay, these, these wise men were, were, were geographically far off, but that's only in context, right? They were far off because the context was from Israel. So if you stand at one point, if I stand at one point, some of you are far off, some of you are near. But if I was standing in the back, those that were once far off are now near. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say there? No one is too far today to be reached by Jesus. Because he's everywhere. And he's working and he's shining light into people's hearts right now. In places that you'll never get to, God's working. Friends, the encouragement is that where you can get to, you be that morning light. You be that star. You, Jesus said, are the light of the world. And we'll look at that in just a moment. The same light that God created in the beginning is the same light that he shines into our life. That same light that, I mean, if you imagine, we can't really do it, but imagine a world that was just in utter and total darkness. There was nothing. And then light pierced through that darkness in that same way, 
God has pierced into our hearts and and is now transforming us by his light and by his life. I love the prayer of the psalmist in Psalm 43, verse 3. The prayer of the psalmist is so powerful. He says this, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. The poet is praying that God would lead him to God through his light and through his truth. This is exactly how God led the wise men to Jesus. This is exactly how God led the children of Israel out of the wilderness and into the promised land. If you remember, we are told that by, there was a cloud by day and a fire by night. There was light in the darkness leading the children of Israel in the wilderness into the promised land. God is always using light to illuminate our eyes and our hearts to lead us in the same direction, and that's towards Jesus. He's always been doing this. When God was creating a world that was habitable, or capable of being uh, inhabited, he first created light. And then at the very end of it all, and it's a great phrase when Jesus said that he is the bright and morning star. He said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the bright and morning star. Alpha and Omega, it's like saying I am the A to Z. It's just that's all it is. I am the A to Z. I am the bright and morning star. I am the one that will light up the world. But more than that, I am the one that can light up your life. God wants in the season that we're in, you know, we all have hopes every year of greater illumination, greater depth, greater this, because we were made for more, right? The end of the year is coming, and we're going to start saying, it's going to be better for me now. I'm going to do this next year. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Totally normal. Do you know why? You were made for more. It's what's in you. You don't have to fight that. Instead, let God's light direct your longing for more Because when we let God's light direct our desire for more, it will lead us to Jesus. It will lead us to a depth in Jesus. It will lead us into a greater hope in Jesus. As I said, and I've said this several weeks to you, and I hope you're seeing this, and this would be the prayer I would want you to consider praying at Christmas time. In the midst of all the beautiful lights, Lord, shine your light into the people around me. Shine light. Because it's beautiful. It's beautiful when it's dark. You know, Christmas lights effect is pretty lame in the middle of the day, isn't it? It's pretty lame. It's like, hey, look at all my lights around. You're like, dude, the sun's out. It's not that cool. And you know, one day, one day, the Bible tells us that when we're in heaven with the Lord forever, that he will light up the night. He will light up the sky. There'll be no day or night in the sense that God is illuminating all things. But today, we still live in a dark world. We still live in a dark world. And and listen, you can accentuate that it's a dark world. And yet, who's gone looking at Christmas lights? You've driven through the Chula Vista area and seen the Christmas lights? Yeah, why do we all love to do that? Because there's nothing more beautiful at Christmas time than when it is dark. You don't go at two in the afternoon. You go when it's dark. Why? Because we love the contrast between light and dark. Because you were made for that. You were made to walk in the light of the Lord. And one day, we're going to shine with the Lord. We're going to be with the Lord. There's going to be no more, there's going to be no more cares, no more tears, no more worries, no more fears, all those kinds of things. I didn't mean to rhyme, it just happened. Um, uh, But what I do know is this. Jesus said this, but while it is dark, while it is dark, the Son of Man has to work. The Son of Man has to be busy while it is dark. And it's still dark. And I think that instead of us accentuating how dark it is, we should be, we, you are the Christmas light. In Jesus, you are. You are the beauty in the world today that can help others to be pointed and directed towards Jesus. The same thing that Jesus used, that light in the sky, he just used it to get people closer to Jesus. That's the whole point. He just used the light in the sky to make them like, okay, well, if I'm going generally in the right direction, I'm going in the right direction. And then in the end, they were right there at the feet of Jesus. 
Friends, that's what he wants to do with each one of our lives. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Rather than you and me, you know, berating the darkness of the world, you must remember, lest you forget what you were saved for, you are the light of the world. You are. And you're like, I'm not a very bright light. Okay, well, let's work on that. As you and I will allow ourselves to bask in the light of who God is, and I commend you, we're here because we need Jesus. We're not here because we're the good people of Chula Vista. We're here because we need Jesus. Can I get an amen on that one, right? I don't want the online people to think that we didn't agree with that because that's the reality. We need Jesus, but when we gather, when we worship the Lord either online as it is right now or here in person, here's what I'm saying to you. We are illuminated by the love, by the heart, by the will, and by the word of God. And now we can go out into the world and we don't ever have to worry about that light diminishing like it did in Moses' day. Moses would stand before God and he would shine and he would stand before the people and day after day it would begin to diminish. But the light in you will never diminish because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells in you. You are not God. There's a big important statement for the day. God, through his son Jesus, dwells in our hearts if we've put our faith in him. And we are the light of the world. At Christmas, when you go out and you see tonight, you see Christmas lights. Oh, it's so pretty. You know why it's so pretty? Because it's dark out. And there's something beautiful today about a Christian who says, I am just, I am going, I want to shine the light of Jesus in the world around me. I just want to shine who Jesus is. And so we gather to be illuminated by God and then we allow ourselves to be the reflection of him in the world that we live in. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. I want to once again read that's what the psalmist said and I'll finish with this thought. He said, send out your light and your truth. That's what the psalmist said. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill. Send out your light. You know, God's given us his truth through his word and by his Holy Spirit. And guess what? He has sent out light. You. Sent you out into the world that you're in. You. There's not better opportunities in a year, you know, year in, year out. There's not better opportunities for you to shine and reflect the light of God than there are at, you know, Easter and Christmas. And yeah, there are rhythms that can be easily become ruts. There, there are stories that we can become, that lure us into a complacency if we're not careful. But here's the reality. You have as much potential this year, in this season, to shine the light of Jesus than maybe, in, and I'm going to say it, than ever before. Do you know why I know that? Because you can't change the past. You can only deal with right now. You have a greatest, the greatest opportunity you and I have ever had is today because today is the only thing we have guaranteed. So it is the greatest opportunity. Can't even, you can't even say that about tomorrow. Today, we have this. We have this opportunity. We have these moments. The Christmas light, the beauty of what God has done is that he did it in a dark world and he's still shining his light into our hearts today. Let's... Uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for the chance to gather around your word and this very idea that you have shined light into the darkness of not only my heart, but also into the darkness of the world around me. And Lord, I don't want this message to be that kind of message where we leave like, okay, yeah, I need to be a better Christian. Because that's never worked for anyone. Instead, Lord, I just want to acknowledge that you are the light of the world. It's you. And you're not asking me to be you, but you're inviting me to let you shine through my life. That's it. Just a surrender. So Lord, I pray for each one of us here, in person or online, that we would surrender. That there'd be a greater surrender that would happen. Yeah, just Lord, at my workplace, let me shine your light in whatever way that would look. Lord, in my home, I want the light of Jesus to shine brighter. 
Lord, in my marriage, I want the light of Jesus to shine brighter. And Lord, in my own thoughts and in my own emotions and in my own fears and dreams and discouragements and doubts, I want the light of the gospel to shine brighter. Lord, Christmas is the time of the year when we remember that there was a group of wise, wise people who met Jesus because they followed a great light. And we now want to help others, Lord, to see you. What a thing, Lord, it must have been to have these, these men show up at a, show up and see a baby, a little kid. And yet they would recognize that God literally moved heaven and earth to get these men before the Savior of the world. And Father, I, I think today as we've celebrated communion, as we've, as we've looked at your word and as we've worshiped in song, Lord, I want to recognize today that you have moved heaven and earth so that we could know you. You became one of us so that we could know you. You died for all of us so that we could know you. Lord, you, you shined light into the darkness so that we could know you. And we give you thanks today, Lord. This is what Christmas is all about. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us, whether online or in person. We pray that the ministry of Calvary San Diego is encouraging you in your faith. If you would like to follow along with what we are doing or hear more teachings, you can do so by downloading the Calvary SD mobile or TV app. Also, if you would like to partner with us and worship through giving, you can do so at calvarysd.com give. Thanks for tuning in.